right, open up your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 3, and that's where we'll begin. <clears throat> by way of uh, introduction, first of all, the, the, the title of my message this morning is The Failure of Prayer. The Failure of Prayer. And we've been looking uh, these last many weeks at all of these, uh, uh, these ideas, these concepts about prayer. We looked last week uh, at, or uh, two weeks ago rather, I wasn't here last week, I was in California, but... Uh, the week prior to that, we talked about the, the frequency of our prayers. We talked about the fervency of our prayers, the faith of our prayers, the focus, the foundation, the function, all of these things. And this morning, I thought it'd be fitting to talk about the failure of prayer because there are times when we pray that our prayers fail. There is a, a, a recent phrase, a, a new phrase that's floating around a lot of uh, social media and a lot of... Uh, uh, YouTube and things of that nature. It's, uh, it's called the epic fail. <laughs> How many of you have seen something that has an epic fail? Raise your hands. Okay, we got a couple of them. I've seen a couple of head nods. The epic fail. And usually what this is, is this are, these people are involved uh, contextually in uh, these extreme sports, right? And uh, they're snowboarders that come down this mountain and an avalanche overcomes them or they're on a skateboard and they jump up on a rail and they fall over and they bash their head or... Maybe they're surfing, right? They're surfing, and this, uh, this wave just comes and, and uh, comes over the top and engulfs them. And, and then there's this little thing that pops up, and it's an epic fail, right? It's an epic, and that's another word, too, that kind of gets under my skin. Everything these days is epic, right? So why not have an epic fail, right? And uh, when it comes to prayers, uh, we have kind of this epic fail, don't we? There are times in our lives when we pray that our prayers just don't seem to be heard. Now let me say this, that the biggest reason that our prayers fail is because we fail to pray. That's, uh, that's number one on the list. If we don't pray, don't expect your prayers to be answered. You have to pray in order for that to happen. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that the reason people are praying less is because less prayers are being answered. I think we, um, we pray to people, or do we pray to God, people pray to God. Hopefully you're not praying to people. <laughs> We pray to God, and when our prayers are not heard, when they're not answered, then we, then we begin to pray less. And then we pray a little bit, and our prayers are not answered, and then we pray less. And then we pray less. And we begin this cycle till almost we don't pray anymore. Now, ironically, we have the God of the universe at our disposal. And uh, we have the, the, the one who can answer all of our prayers, uh, far above that which we know, uh, in Ephesians 3.20, uh, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Uh, so far more than we can ask or think. Now that just, uh, that just it, it stumble, I stumble on this because we, we ask, right? He does more than what we ask for. And yet we don't seem to ask for a whole lot. One guy says this, prayer seems like such a small thing to do. We tend to pray as a, a last resort when there is nothing else we can do. And what a shame it is that we pray so little to a God who can give us so much, so much more than we ask for. And sometimes even in our prayers we say, well, Lord, I don't even know if you can answer this one or not. And the reality is God can answer our prayers. Now, I, I answered prayer... Can I say this, that answered prayer is the best antidote to an apathetic prayer life. The more we pray, the more we have prayers answered, the more that spurs us on to pray. I hope that's the lesson that you hear this morning. But if you want to pray more, have more of your prayers answered. Here's an interesting statistic or two that I found on the website. And uh, I don't know how credible this website is. I don't know how they populate statistics. Uh, you've heard that 73.5% of statistics are made up on the spot, right? Some of you will get that in just a minute. I have no idea how many statistics are made up on the spot. I just made that one up. But at any rate, uh, this is a, a statistic that is, that is pulled from this place called uh, BeliefNet. And they funded a poll to learn more about why, how, where, and when people pray. And here's a, a, a summary of their findings, and this is just a few things. There was a huge list of 10 or 20 of these uh, statistics, but, but I just want to give you three real quick. First of all, 41% of people say that their prayers are answered often. 
Now, I don't know how they, how they, they got down to this. How they, they, did, did they, did they uh, uh, ask professing Christians? Did they ask Christians who actually have placed their faith in Christ alone? I have no idea uh, who they exactly pulled, but, but 41% say that their prayers are answered often. Now, can I ask you this question? Do you believe that when you pray, your prayers are answered 41% of the time? If you were to pray 100 prayers, 41% of them get answered. just thought that was interesting. Uh, 1.5% say that that their prayers are never answered. 1.5% of people say that their prayers are never answered. And again, I I think uh, think, uh, never is kind of this ambiguous term in this sense. When you ask somebody, never? No, never. Never, ever? No, never, ever. Never, ever, ever? Well, maybe there was this one prayer. (laughs) Right? So they did get answered, so they would not fall into this category. However, this is a very small percentage of the people, but the prayers are never answered. My hope and my prayer is that your prayers are answered. That when you go to God and you ask Him for things, for something, that He answers your prayer. This one, this one got me. Over 73% say that their prayers are not answered or when their prayers are not answered, the most important reason is because they did not fit God's plan. Let me read that again. 73% say when their prayers are not answered, the most important reason is because they did not fit God's plan. You see, there is a group of people that say that when they pray and their prayers fail, it was because they weren't aligned with God's plan. And so essentially what they're saying is they're not praying right. So is there in a case, yes, where you can pray and your prayers fail? Yes, you have failed prayers when they're not in line with God's will. So let's look at two things that I think will be helpful to you this morning. First of all, number one is we don't pray right. We don't pray right. In James, uh, James 4, 1 to 4, it says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even as your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's very powerful. Very, very powerful. We just don't pray right. Now, some of you may say, well, are you saying that that there is a certain way that you have to pray? Kind of. Here's what I'm saying. Yes, there's flexibility in our prayers and as we communicate with God. But is there a formula? I believe so. I believe so. And we're not going to talk about the flexibility or the formula. Those are two other messages. But let's look real quickly at we worship the wrong God. We worship the wrong God. When we look back at verse 2, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, ye have not because ye ask not. Lusting after and desiring for something is what we call idolatry. Matter of fact, it's not just me that calls it idolatry. God in the Bible calls that idolatry. When you're seeking after something, seeking after something beside the Creator. In a sense, we all worship the gods of stuff. We all worship the gods of stuff. There's hardly a store that I go into, especially when we're talking like a a gun store or something like that. I say when I go into a gun store, I can't bring my wallet. I I have to bring my wallet, that's how I give the gospel. I, I cannot bring money in that wallet, right? I, there are things, there are times I go into a store and you go into Dick's Sporting Goods or Field and Stream or something like that, and you just have to have it all, don't you? You, you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, I got to have that and I got to have that. And you're in a constant state of denial. Like, I'm not going to buy that. 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 Until you move and you realize that all that stuff I said I didn't buy, I bought all that stuff because look at all this stuff I have. And and I think most people, when they, when they move, they, they realize that they have to move a little more often, right? Because uh, I've, I've heard this from so many people. They say, I need to move every year or so because I just accumulate stuff in my basement. And so one way to avoid that is not to have a basement. And they say, but I have a garage. I say, well, don't have a garage. Just have a smaller area and you won't have to covet all of the stuff, right? But I think we are in a culture. 
I think we are in a culture that kind of endorses this idea and, and really uh, gets excited about the stuff that we have. And we worship the stuff. And our culture is a culture that worships the creation more than the creator. And in Romans 1, 18 and 25, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Drop down to verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Are we not in a society that is more excited about the things that are created than the one who creates those things? And it's a shame, but we all do this. And so when I'm saying that we all, I'm not saying you all, I'm saying we all, I am part of that. And we all have this tendency to, to, uh, to seek the, the pleasurable things in life. We tend to seek these things that, that give us kind of this immediate pleasure and we worship the gods of stuff. I think more people today are, are fighting over getting something they do not have in order to have something that no one else does. They go out there and they, 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 try to, they, try to, uh, they try to grab it all, don't they? And, uh, and, and they, they want the newest and the latest. And, and one of the fads that I've seen is with the iPhone. You know, the average iPhone is like $1,000. And it's just like every time a new iPhone comes out, and this is, this, is, this is how they do it. They plan it just right. You see, the rollout technique is just wonderful for them. But you just have to have the newest and the latest and greatest and the updated car and the nicer house and, and all of this stuff. And, 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 and you, we, tend to, we tend worshiping the gods of stuff. Many years ago, I remember this decades ago, my dad and I were driving by this junkyard and he looked out at this junkyard and he pointed to the junkyard and he says, at one point in time, every one of those cars was somebody's dream. I remember him saying that to me. How long is it before the dream of the new iPhone, the dream of the new stuff, the new house, that dream just kind of ends up fading away and then you know what, we're left just looking for another dream. This is called uh, hedonism. This is called hedonism, just wanting to, be, uh, to, to have this pleasure. Uh, it, it, hedonism is a school of thought that argues that the pursuit of pleasure and intrinsic goods are the primary and most important uh, topic of life. It, it, it's the one thing that we just go out there, we just want to be happy, don't we? We just want to be happy. And, and, uh, and let me tell you how that distorts our prayers, because we don't pray right when we're, when we're focused on pleasure. When we're just all worried about what's in it for me, how can, how can I pray right to God when, when all I'm doing is going out there and just, I always want it for me? We don't pray right. We are asking the temporal gods of our stuff to fulfill our eternal needs. You know what? When those, when those temporal things, when they wane, when they rust out, when they fall apart, you know what we need to do? We need to go back and we need to get another thing. And so we're worshiping the wrong gods, we're praying to the wrong gods, we're asking God to give us all of these things that just make us feel good inside, right? Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Is that not just true? Like your eyes just keep wanting more and more and more, and, 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 and it's never full, is it? It's never full. I can never have enough guns, and, and, and for me, that's true. I think I, I look at my gun safe, and I see all this room <laughs> in my gun safe. I'm like, oh, what can I put in there? Ah, that's a, be a shotgun right about there. Yeah, yeah, and then I go into a gun store, and I say, hey, that's the one right there. I was at the gun range with, uh, with uh, John, and, and we went out there, and I was talking to these kids, this kid and this dad. Remember, I was over there shooting with them. Not shooting them. <laughs> I was shooting with them. And uh, we've got this, uh, this really cool plink, uh, I don't even know what it is, it's just a cool gun. Matter of fact, I, I told them, they said, that is a really cool gun? The kid asked me, he asked me when I go over there, John, he says, is that, is that, is that a full auto? And I'm like, no, it just looks like it's a full auto, you know? And, and, uh, and, and the dad and the son, they say, that's a really cool looking gun. I'm like, yeah, you never buy a gun because it's cool. But I bought this gun because it was cool. My kids looked at it on the shelf and they said, that's a cool gun. And I said, yeah, that is a cool looking gun. I got to have that one. So now I open my gun safe and I'm like, all right, now I got a little more space in there. What can I put in there? And you know, that's where we go with our minds. And we just, we just, uh, hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. There's always something more to put in that spot, isn't it? And you have to be very, very, very careful of that. We have to be very careful of that. We have, uh, we, we have desired the things. 
get this, the very things that will be our own destruction. We, we are, in a sense, being consumed by a world where we are constantly consuming things. It's just one thing after the next thing after the next thing. We don't pray right. Can I say that this morning, that we don't pray right? We worship the wrong gods and we seek pleasure. And don't get me wrong, sin for a season is pleasurable. And in, in Hebrews 11, 24, 25, it says this, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It was pleasurable for a season. How many of us have gotten into trouble with some sin in our lives and, and it's only pleasurable for that long? And then we have to suffer the consequence for that pleasure. Hedonism. Go out there and pursue. Pray that you, you, you can fulfill all of your own desires and, and go out there and just, just consume, consume, consume until one day you realize that now I have to pay a penalty for this. And that sin was only pleasurable for a season. We have failed prayers because... We are praying to the wrong God. We're praying to the God of stuff. And when we pray, we need to make sure that we're asking for something that's eternal. You know, the world will pass away. In 1 John 2.17, And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Are we praying for things that are eternal, or are we praying to the wrong gods? Can I say secondly that we're also praying for the wrong goods? In James 4, 3, ye ask and receive not because, mark this, ye ask amiss. Ready? That you may consume it upon your lusts. How many times have you asked for something that only benefits you? How many times have you asked for the wrong goods? I want something, Lord, because it benefits me. How many times have we tried to justify to God the reason why he ought to give us such and such? How many times have we prayed that way? Let me ask you a question here this morning, church. Do you pray with the right motives? Do you pray with the right motives? Do you pray with the right motives? That's a very searching question. Now, I'm not saying that time, at times that I haven't prayed for the wrong things the wrong way with the wrong motives because I've done it and I still do it and shame on me. But you know what? This is a course correction in my life. Pray with the right motives. Are you asking for things that you may consume them upon your own lusts? I think another reason why we have failed prayers is because we're asking something that we may get out of it. It goes back to that 73% of people, right, who, who, when their prayers haven't been answered, they realize that it did not fit in God's plan. Let me give you just some examples. I just jotted down a few, of, uh, a few prayers that maybe would, would, would help uh, kind of uh, urge us on to excellence when it comes to prayer. How about this? Maybe when we pray, do we pray, Lord, I pray for my wife? Good prayer. I pray for my wife that she's spiritual. That's a good prayer. Because, Lord, if she's spiritual, she'll be, she'll be nicer to people. And you know, Lord, I'm one of those people she's not very nice to. Let me ask you something. Are your prayers tainted with that sort of, with that sort of garbage? Let me ask you this. Lord, I, I, I pray for my children. Good prayer. I pray for my children, Lord, that... Um, uh, that they read their Bible and that they memorize their Bible. Lord, I, I, I pray, this is a good prayer. I pray that they love you, Lord, and that they immerse themselves in your word and memorize the scripture. Because there's things in the Bible that can help them, Lord. There's things in the Bible about honoring their parents, which they're not honoring me very well, Lord. And I'm just praying that you'd work a work in their life that they can get right with God, that they can be right with me. What about this? This is, this is another, another great prayer. Lord, I, 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 pray, that, I pray that people are, 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 are tithers. I pray that they give a good tithe and an offering, Lord. Good prayer. 
I pray that they give a good tithe and an offering because buildings like this just don't, just don't keep the lights on by themselves, you know? Uh, Mid-American energy still wants their money. And Lord, how would, it, how would it be if I had to preach in the dark? Lord, I pray that, I pray that we have good tithers and good, good people with, that, that give good offerings because, Lord, we need, we need money. And you know what? Maybe someday I'll get a raise. Seemingly a good prayer to start, but tainted with a lot of myself in there, isn't it? Lord, I pray people come to church. It's good. I pray that you folks come to church. You know, I, I, I pray for, for you all by name almost every Sunday. Isn't that just amazing? Like, I do that. I pray that God would inspire you to come to church. But if this parking lot sits empty, Lord, what's it going to look like to the community? It's not a right prayer, is it? Ask yourself this question, friends. Do you pray with pure motives? How often are our prayers tainted with our own passions? Uh, R.A. Torrey said this, a selfish purpose in prayer robs prayer of its power. Don't pray with selfish motives. And can I say this too, that, uh, that God knows you better than you know you. God knows whether or not you're praying for the right reasons or not. If we want God to work in our prayers, you need to call out to him in truth and not false pretense. And how many times have we prayed with false pretense? Kind of under the umbrella of something that's spiritual. Lord, I, I just pray that people get saved. I pray that people don't go to hell. I pray that people come to church. I pray that people tithe. And Lord, because I look good as a pastor. Or am I really concerned about their soul? Lord, I want them saved. And if they never come to this church, praise God, at least they got them saved. Lord, if they come to this church, fantastic. If they never give a dime, that's between you and them. Lord, if they never get baptized, that's on them. It's not about numbers, it's not about money, it's not about people, it's not about me, and so oftentimes we're tainted with ourselves, aren't we? Our prayers are just, are just a, kind of a mask for us asking uh, God for things that we want. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And we should be the ones that are asking God to search us. In Psalm 139, uh, the psalmist said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Did you know you don't have to pray that prayer for God to know your thoughts? He's going to know your thoughts anyway. You, you're not trying to pull a trick on God and say, Lord, I'm, I'm only going to pray this uh, in the event that my thoughts are in line and, and, and pure and, and right. No, he's going to say, I know your thoughts regardless if you pray the prayer, Joe. What if we all prayed like this, though? What if we all prayed a prayer to God that was, to God, know my thoughts. Know my thoughts. Verse 24 of Psalm 139 says, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Lord, I, I want to know, is, is there any wicked, wicked way in me? Is there, something, is there something in me that's wicked? Know my thoughts. Try me, Lord. Tell you what, if we prayed that, we'd know our own thought life better. If we prayed for God to know our thought life, we would know our thought life better. Let me just give you a, some application here real quick. Make sure when you pray, you know why it is you're praying. You know, give your prayer life some thought. If you were to stand before somebody of great importance, you would be working this out in your mind, wouldn't you? You'd be thinking of all of the things that you should say when you get in the presence of this very important person. And how many times do we get on our knees and we just pray to God and it's just, it, it's just kind of like a shotgun blast. You don't hit anything unless you're John. John was out there, never shot a clay pigeon. Poof, out of the sky. Amazing. Anyways, I'm a little jealous of that. <laughs> yeah, it, it is documented. I took a photo of him and it just like random, click, 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 poof, blew it out of the sky. I was like, are you kidding me? Couldn't delete it fast enough. <laughs> it's true. And then I sent it to him, and his wife, and I don't know. I just I felt so humbled over that. 
Many people just pray without considering the purpose of their prayer life. Consider your prayers, but consider the purpose of your prayer. Oswald Chambers said, Is there too much of me and too little of others in my prayer? I think we have a problem with the way we pray. Secondly, not only do we not pray right, we don't live right. We don't pray right and we don't live right. Does living right have anything to do with the failure of prayers? It certainly does. A person cannot just say, I mean, they, they can say this, it's not to make it true. Just because you say something doesn't make it true. Can I say that? You know, it's, I think we're in a, in a society that says, because I said it, it's true. <laughs> well, not unless God said it first. Then it's true, okay? Then you're just parroting what God said. A person cannot live any way they want and expect to have their prayers answered. And it takes a humble spirit to have prayers answered. And oftentimes our best prayers are from a broken spirit. When we have a broken spirit. I'm not talking about being out, having a broken heart. I'm saying when our spirit is broken and when we pray to God, I think that's when we have our best prayers. I think people are enjoying wickedness. Psalm 66, 18. This is what I mean by not living right. They enjoy wickedness. Psalm 66, 18 says this, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. One commentator said, if I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, this is what it literally means, see iniquity with pleasure. So you're seeing your sin with pleasure. You're looking at your sin saying, I have pleasure in my sin. Now this verse isn't saying that if a, person pray, a person's prayers will not be heard if they sin, but if they're taking pleasure in their sin. And how often is it that we as Christians, listen up, how often is it that we as Christians, we take pleasure in our sin? We maybe know that we're doing what we're doing is not right. We know that it does not honor God, but we do not condemn it. We do not walk away from it. We say, Lord, I, I don't mind this sin all that much. And, and we even try to almost de-emphasize the fact that it is in fact a sin. We say, I take pleasure in this sin. I'm not concerned with this, Lord. I know it might be wrong, but, but, but I'm not really all that over, overly concerned with it. Sinning without regard to the consequences of your sin will hinder your prayers. The consequence of your sin is that you've offended God. You know, there's a lot of consequences out there for your sin. Can I say that? There's a lot of consequences for your sin of speeding, of, 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 of drinking, of pornography, of gambling, all of these things. We, we, know, we know that. There's a lot of consequence, but the biggest consequence of all is you've sinned against God. And if I can get that through my head, and if I can get it through your head, that the biggest sin is not a sin against your wife. It's not a sin against your husband. It's not a sin against your kids. It's a sin against God. And how often is it that we just engage in this sin? And, and, and desirably, we just go into it, and we enjoy it. And then you think your prayers are going to be heard? There are some that love their sin more than the Savior. So the Lord chooses not to hear their prayer. Spurgeon said this, Doubtless, many lose power in prayer because their lives are grievous in the sight of the Lord and He cannot smile upon them. If we are loving the pleasure of sin, don't expect to have favor of the Father. So we enjoy wickedness, and that's a hindrance to prayer. That keeps our, our prayers from being heard. How about this? This is a good one. How about not honoring our wives? Now this is kind of, there's, a, there's an irony here because today's Father's Day. And uh, my wife found that out a couple hours after she woke up this morning. She called me and I was over at the headquarter building. She called me and she says, I'm a terrible wife. And I said, what's going on? I mean, what's, oh, I don't know. I mean, was, is everything okay? And she says, she says, I'm just a terrible wife. And I'm like, oh no, should I come home? And she says, she says, it's Father's Day. And I said, oh, yeah, I guess I forgot too. <laughs> I guess it is Father's Day, isn't it? And she says, happy Father's Day. And I said, well, amen. Thank you, honey. And so today is the day where we honor fathers, and here it is. I'm, I'm telling us husbands to, to honor our wives. One of the biggest reasons why men's prayers are hindered 
is because we're not honoring our wives. First Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. This does not say lesser person. Can I say that? I'm here and my wife is here. It's not talking about a lesser person. Maybe a weaker vessel? Maybe yes. Listen to this. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Can I say this, guys, that if you do not honor your wives, your prayers are hindered? If we are not honoring our wives, our, our prayers are going to be hindered. This should be no surprise, though, to us men. We pray and we ask God for things. We ask God to bless our family, but yet at the same time, we're not honoring the family that God has given us to honor. It should take us by no surprise that after God said in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that we should, that we should honor our wives. Let me say this real quickly to you men, okay? Can I say this? Men, love and honor your wife. Love and honor your wife. And can I say this even when they're not lovely? Because there are some times maybe in your marriage where you say, boy, I just, I, I am really struggling here. The Bible principle is to honor your wives. Not honor your wives when your wives are on the best behavior. That would be easy. It's easy to love the lovely, isn't it? But husbands, honor your wives. And can I say this, wives? Treat your husbands right too. Wives, treat your husbands right. Not just because it's Father's Day. But treat your husbands right. You know, I like to see a marriage where the husband and the wife, they treat each other with, with great respect and great honor. And, and, and there's, a, there's even a due diligence in their life to make sure that their wives and their husbands are put first. C can I say this? If you're always trying to put your wife first and wives, if you're always trying to put your husband first, uh, if anything, there'll be competition on who treats each other better. Now, that's a good competition to enter into. I want to treat my wife better than she's going to treat me. And my wife says, I'm going to treat my husband better than he's going to treat me. What a great place to be. Husbands, wives, treat your spouses right. 1 Peter 3, 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But listen to this. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. This is a universal principle. This isn't just to the wives. This isn't just to the husbands. This isn't just to the sons or the daughters or, or the employers or the employees, universal principle, that the eye, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And we wonder why our prayers aren't being heard. We wonder why our prayers aren't being heard. We go to the cross, we go to God, and we say, Lord, I pray that you hear my prayers, and yet at the same time, we, we, we need to reconcile with our wife because we're not honoring her. Or we're maybe not loving our wives like we should. Or maybe we're embracing and indulging in wickedness and sin in our life. If we regard Nick, we don't in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. We have to ask ourselves, are we part of the percentage of people who pray whose prayers never get answered because of us? Are, have we polluted our prayers with ourselves? Have I got a lot of me in my prayers? Or am I praying that God would, would, would do a great thing despite me? That if I'm never there to see another soul saved, that people are still going to be saved? If, I, if the money never comes in, that's between you and God. If the seats are never full, that's between you and God. But me being faithful is a very important thing. Me being faithful and not praying with me involved in that at all. Can I just say this in conclusion, that obedience to God in general is the way we get our prayers answered. Obedience to God is the way we get our prayers answered. Proverbs 28, 9 says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. One commentator said this, If on the other hand, we turn a deaf ear to his precepts, he will likely turn a deaf ear to our prayers. If we are not going to listen to God and obey him, why should he listen and obey us. Let's be very careful that when we pray, we pray right and we live right. 
If you want prayers answered, that's a good place to start. Now, there's a lot of other reasons why prayers aren't answered. And we'll talk about that at another time. But right now, there's food in the kitchen. And there's hungry, hungry bellies out here in the church. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I'm asking you that you trust in Him as your Savior. You know, salvation isn't about what we can do for the Lord. It's about what the Lord did for us. If we had to do something for Him, then we would be the Savior. But He did it for us. And I'm thankful for that. And if you're here today and you don't know where you're going when you die, I want this hand right here, and I mean it reverently, to represent the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that we all have sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single person in this room has done something wrong. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Separation from God forever. Somebody has to make the payment for the sin. Either you make that payment and you spend an eternity separated from God or we trust that He made the payment because the wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross to pay for our sin. I'm so thankful for that. And the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There are a lot of people out there who are trying to work their way to heaven, trying to do good deeds and trying to be a good person. I think being a good person is good, but it's not good enough to get you to heaven. There needs to be a death payment because the wages of sin is death. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth to die on a cross for our sin. That makes Him the Savior, not us. And if you don't know where you're going today, if you simply just trust in Christ alone as your personal Savior, you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. 1 John 5.13 tells us that we can know for sure that we'll be in heaven when we die simply by placing our faith in Him. 